Christ in me beholds the Christ in you. Now last Sunday we began a series of Sunday messages on the teachings of Jesus, which I'm calling, So Do You Want to Dance? And this morning I'm going to speak about the four basic methods that Jesus uses to teach. Uh, but I did make a change here. Instead of focusing on the parables, which initially I was going to begin, I decided to, to, uh, to speak this morning about the precepts of Jesus. The parables and precepts are two of the four teething, main teaching methods that Jesus used. Another was uh, the miracles that he did, and the fourth uh, category were uh, the examples and the actions that Jesus took. That was a fourth kind of teaching method. But let me begin here by sharing with you why I believe it is important to study the teachings of Jesus. I believe that the teachings of Jesus help us to return to the center of our true self where God, where God dwells. Whenever we find ourselves wandering off course on the spiritual journey that we are traveling on, and I love the way spiritual teacher, writer, and poet uh, Mark Nepo speaks of this in his book, uh, which I love. It's called The Exquisite Risk, Daring to Live an Authentic Life. It's packed full of stories that are humorous, that are, make you really think about things. And this is what he wrote about this idea of centering. He wrote, though we can't see it, our life is carried in an open vessel. And I'm going to switch now to read this from the book. Though we can't see it, our life is carried in an open vessel that mystics have called the soul. Think of it as a canoe. Anyone who has been in a canoe or a rowboat knows that if left alone, the boat will drift. In a stream or a river, the current will always move this boat if left alone. The current will carry us, but we need from time to time to paddle or to row, to steer our way back to where the current is clear and strong. He write, this gives us a way to understand our journey on earth, for at the center of the stream of life there is an unstoppable current of spirit, the energy of oneness, that vital, original presence that all beings have longed for. Mark continues, this is the purpose of faith, he says, to believe that this current is there, even though we can't see it. And this is the purpose of will, to correct our inevitable drifting with a paddle here and a paddle there. Not trying to do it all ourselves, but trying to restore our native position in the ancient and immediate current so that it can carry us into tomorrow. This image also gives us a way to understand our humanness and our need for inner practice. For when a canoe drifts right or left, or it gets stuck in the roots of an old willow tree, it's not wrong or evil or lacking. It is just being a canoe. Likewise, our rush to judge ourselves and others for what goes wrong or not as we planned is a distraction from engaging the nature of living, which he says is drifting and steering. With discernment, but without judgment, the human journey is one of steering our way back to center over and over again. So this is really about learning the art of canoeing. I love that passage. Now, I have never been on a rowboat, and I've never been in a canoe. I don't swim. Okay? I wish that, like Jesus, I could walk on the water, but I'm a bit more like Peter, who realized what he was doing and sank. Okay? Uh, but I understand this in a way, because it's kind of a universal thing to me, this idea of the current, okay, the river of life and that we are on this current. Uh, one of my favorite, favorite stories by Richard Bach uh, be, uh, actually becomes, it, it comes as an introduction to the book Illusions, okay? And the master in this little pre-story 
tells a story to a crowd of people and he talks about the little people. Any of you know this story? I call them the little people. Okay. Uh, they are uh, a bunch of creatures who live under the ocean. And all of their lives, they cling to the rocks and stones there at the river bottom. Uh, and this is what their life consists of. The golden river, crystal river, flowing over them all the time. And this is what their life is, clinging to the bottom, never knowing freedom. And then one day, one of the little creatures decides, I believe that this river knows where it's going. I'm going to let go. And I'm going to let it carry me where it will. And his friend said, you fool. Okay. The minute you let go, you're going to be smashed up against the rocks and you will die quicker than boredom. But he heeded them not and he let go. And at once the river smashed him up against the rocks. And he was hurt. Yet he was not defeated. And in time, as he healed, he decided to try it again. He decided to let go. Now this time, the river, the water, lifted him free from the bottom. And it carried him in the stream. And he realized this is what life is about. It's not about clinging down there to at the bottom there with the rocks and the stones. It's about this floating in the current, the current of life. And as he moved downstream, there were some other creatures uh, like him who were at the river bottom. And through the clear water, they saw him floating. And they said, look, look, the Savior, come, come to save us the Messiah, uh, and they got very excited, and he said, I'm not the Messiah. I'm no more Messiah than you are. He said, the river delights to lift us free. If only we will let go, if we'll trust. And they didn't hear him. All the more they cried out, Messiah, come to save us. And when they looked again, he was gone. And this lesson, uh, to me, it, it epitomizes this growth journey that we are all on, this, this spiritual journey. And the teachings of Jesus are like the little paddle that we, we have to uh, use on our boat when it's drifting to move it further and further and back to the center where the water current is strong and pure. And so the teachings, this, this is my parable. The teachings of Jesus are like a paddle that we use to move our boat of self, of soul, back to the center current, which is that place where God dwells within us. Some call this river, this movement, the Holy Spirit. Jung called it, Jung called it the unconscious. Native Americans call it Wankantanka. And Buddhists call it the Dramakaya, the stream of suchness. But whatever we name it, this current, this water of life, this river of God, never stops from rushing or carrying whatever dares to enter it. The truth is, we are already in this current. We were born in this current. But we have conscious will and choice as to how we will flow with it. Some of us go resisting this current, resisting change, resisting growth, because it's scary. It is the unknown. Jesus teaches us that we have nothing to fear that there is this presence and power of God that indwells each of us. In unity, we call it the Christ. And this is our security. Life is eternal. Life is a journey. I'm remembering a song that Rochelle wrote called Life is a Journey. Beautiful song. And um, I wish you were here to sing that this morning. But I believe it is true. And I think that Jesus teaches us a way, a method, some tools and techniques to flow in this river current. 
and unity here, we believe that Jesus gave full expression to this presence of God, which dwelt within him. And, you know, he was always saying that we could do what he did. The miracles he did, the works that he did, Jesus always, uh, he always put the focus on us. And he said, the things I do, you shall do. And greater than this shall you do if you believe. Now, this is a big thing to believe, okay? And I think that most of us don't really believe it. I think that most Christians have kind of overlooked this, that Jesus said, the things he did, we shall also do, and also be able to do. And he really believed it because he said, follow me. Can we follow if we cannot do what Jesus did? So these are the reasons why Jesus' teachings are important to us here in Unity. Uh, and it is not so much about that we want to worship Jesus and dwell on the personality. It is that we want to understand what Jesus understood. Paul said that it is about having that same mind that Christ had in us. It is about developing that same kind of understanding of our connection with the presence and power of God that Jesus said indwells us. So I was going to speak about parables, but I decided to speak about the precepts. So the precepts that I'm referring to are in the fifth chapter of Matthew. They're called the Beatitudes. And the Beatitudes are Jesus' introduction to his Sermon on the Mount. And there is a lot of truth, a lot of learning in these precepts. And I'd like to share some of this with you. There are eight verses, and all of them begin with blessed. Isn't that a beautiful word? Blessed. Blessed are. I have printed in your bulletin the first three uh, of the Beatitudes. And we're going to work with the remaining five next Sunday. But we have here the first. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And we understand in our unity teachings that the Bible is a, is basically, it is still our textbook, our fundamental textbook here in unity, because Charles Fillmore gave the understanding that the Bible, from Genesis all the way through Revelation, this is uh, a book about you, it's a book about me. Because in the pages, in the stories, in the names of the people, in the activities of the characters in the Bible, we see what's happening in our lives as we grow spiritually. We have an Adam in us. Okay? Uh, we have a Joseph who had the coat of many colors in us. These characters represent aspects of our own consciousness. And the things that they experience represents experiences that we also have in our lives, if understood from a spiritual perspective. And so we metaphysically interpret or spiritually interpret the stories, the activities, and things that go on in the Bible. And I will do this also with the precepts of Jesus. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now, a lot of people confuse this and think that Jesus is saying we are blessed when we are poor. That it is God's will that we be poor. That's not what Jesus says in this precept. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Now, the poor in spirit also sounds like a negative, but uh, the Bible often uses expressions and idioms that, um, that were common in those days, but may have a different slant as we understand them today. So what Jesus is saying is that blessed are the poor in spirit. Now, think of this. Now, again, uh, I'm not from these parts. I'm not from the Midwest, okay? I don't know anything about horses, okay? But I have read... And I've seen on television that ranchers often have to break the spirit 
of the wild horses in order to be able to train them. They are used to their freedom uh, and they have to work with them. Now it sounds like a negative thing to break their spirit, okay? It sounds like a sad thing to me. But unless this happens, the horse cannot be trained and it cannot be used in certain ways. It cannot be a helper to man unless it is able to be trained. Now I don't know, I'm not a horse whisperer, okay? And I don't know uh, what the real effect is psychologically on the horse um, to have its freedom in a sense taken away. But there is something about surrendering to a greater power, a higher influence, and hence we all make sacrifices and in a sense we are all broken in certain ways. I read something that said our brokenness is how the light of God comes in and how the light of God goes out through us in the cracks of self. So I believe that what Jesus is saying about being poor in spirit is about the same kind of thing that we are to be, what's the word? We are to be willing to be trained. Now, someone who is conceited and puffed up about themselves, well, God may have a problem getting through to this person, okay? Because they're already filled with themselves. Okay? And so sometimes a person like this needs experiences that kind of tone them in certain ways, okay? Uh, and, you know, that's the proverbial knock on the head with a two by four, okay? This does not need to happen. We do not need to experience this. But if we choose that this is the way that we need to learn, I think that God and the universe conspire together to give us what we think we need. Um, so what Jesus is saying is that we need to be willing to be poor in our self-conceit. We need to allow our spirit to be, to be worked with. We need to allow God to express in us and through us. Jesus is talking about our willingness to let go of the negative, untrainable aspects that we hold in our minds. He's saying that we need to be poor in our conceit and in the self-pride that we have that tells us that we are superior to other people. Basically, it means blessed are those who are poor in pride. A prideful person is one who cannot easily be taught because, as I mentioned, they are already too full of themselves. To be teachable, we've got to be willing to lay aside our old pre preconceived ideas, the beliefs, then the attitudes that keep us from being open to learn something new. I imagine that it was pretty tough for people in the old days when everyone thought that the world was flat. People knew the world was flat, okay? They were fearful when friends took journeys because they knew that they would reach the end of the earth and fall off. And then one day, I believe it was Copernicus, who related the understanding that the world is not flat. The world is round. And no one falls off the end of it. This was a mighty change. And I believe it was very difficult for a lot of people to accept in those days. They did not have planes. They could not fly over and see. All they saw was what their eyes could see in the horizon. And it looked like there might be an end looking with the physical eyes. Jesus teaches us to look with other kinds of eyes. The eyes of our understanding. The eyes of our heart. And here he is saying that it may be difficult for us to let go of some of the old understandings, but it is necessary. And that's what being poor in spirit is. And when Jesus gives these precepts, he begins with a condition that if we accept that condition, 
or that attitude, and we work to have that kind of attitude, there's always a benefit. There's always a blessing. And here, the kingdom of heaven is the reward for someone who chooses to let go of their, their self-will, their self-conceit. The kingdom of heaven is the reward for someone who is willing to be teachable and open to the truth of God. Now, we move on to the second, which is, blessed are they who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Now, at first read, this does, it does look like we're supposed to be happy if we are mourning. We're supposed to be happy if we lose someone important to us in our lives. And we lose all kinds of things. Loved ones, favorite pets, we lose jobs, opportunities, we lose dreams and desires sometimes, and we mourn for these things because they have been a part of us and they have brought us some kind of joy. And so it's difficult to let go. It's difficult to let go of some of the negative things, the painful things as well. Sometimes, unfortunately, we want to relive these things. We want to try and understand them and get underneath them. And maybe the thing we need to do is to let them go, to forgive them and to release them. And so, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. We understand that this presence and power we call God is divine love in action. And I believe that it is often true that when we are at our lowest point, then we seem to be more open to the activity of God working in us. When things are going well, sometimes we forget to work with ourselves so that we are constantly open to this presence and power. Jesus was constantly working with himself. What do we think he did when he went to the mountain top? and the side of the mountains, left the crowd, and went off by himself to be still. He was choosing to be open to this presence within. And when we are open to this presence, if we are mourning, if we have lost something important to us, and our heart is hurting, this presence and power is a healing, comforting, strengthening, presence and power. And uh, all we need to do is open ourselves to it. And the promise is, we shall be comforted. Precept number three. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Now, does anyone use the word meek anymore? I don't think so. Uh, yes, I'm dating myself, okay. Uh, what did Jesus mean by this? Because certainly, we don't think of meek people as being very successful. In fact, we think that it's the, the, the bold people, the courageous people, those who stand up and move forward and enter the fray, who are successful. Made me think of a, a daytime show. It was called Bold, The Bold and the Beautiful, I think. Anyone watch that? The Bold and the Beautiful. Um, and that's who we think are the successful ones. Those are the ones that we think inherit the earth. But that is not what Jesus is saying. He said, Blessed are the meek, for they are the ones who shall inherit the earth. So, what does meekness mean? It would seem to be someone who is cowering, someone who is fearful, uh, someone who holds themselves back because they are uncertain. But what meekness really means is having a certain sensitivity or a surrendering of our consciousness to the influence of something. Remember, 
when we are working with the Bible here in Unity, we see things in a different way. Uh, they don't mean what they appear to mean to most people. We get beyond that to a deeper level of what these things mean. And usually, always, it has something to do with our consciousness. So this meekness is a state of consciousness. The word meek comes from a Greek word, and it has the connotation of something being tamed. And here's that wild horse story again. Something being tamed so that it can be used in a different way, in a higher way. So Jesus is not talking about having a meekness to other people, but Jesus is talking about having a certain attitude toward God. Jesus was meek toward God. He acknowledged that I of my own self can do nothing. But he also said the words that I speak and the work that I do, this is God speaking through me and working through me. He also said, he who has seen me sees the Father. He said, I am the light of the world. But he also said, you and I are the light of the world. So in our meekness, it is good for us to acknowledge that humanly we have our frailties. I think that is why we are in communities. We are in families. We are in friendships. We are in association with other human beings because we can help each other out. When my light may be dimming, perhaps yours is bright enough for both of us. When I find it difficult to love or to forgive and to be compassionate toward myself, perhaps your love and compassion toward me can lift me up. So this meekness is acknowledging that we are spiritual beings, yes, but we are also working through this human side of life. And we experience problems and difficulties. Jesus said, in this world, you will have trials and tribulation. But be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Now, we might think, well, that's good for Jesus. Okay. But Jesus was speaking as the Christ. That I in us, the Christ self, is the overcomer. It's the overcomer in Jesus, but it's also the overcomer in us. There was a song that was called... Uh, Let's see, what was it? Uh, how big is God? And uh, the question raised in the song is, is there anything too big for God to be able to handle? Too big for God to be able to heal? Too big for, uh, for God to guide us through? And the answer in the song was no. Nothing is too big for God to work for good in our life experience. And so being meek allows us to recognize our humanness, but also it allows us to recognize that within us is a mighty power and presence, the only presence and power operating in the world. And because of this, we are conquerors. Because of this, we can move through our lives. We can face whatever we need to face. We can flow in that stream and move ourselves back to the center when we find ourselves like that canoe or boat uh, drifting away from this awareness of being centered in the God presence. And so our meekness means that we are to harness our inner potential. And this makes us masters in our own life. This is, in a sense, inheriting the earth, the earthly experience that we have. So to sum up, blessed are the poor in spirit. When we work at being less prideful, we are able to receive God ideas. and We gain the kingdom of heaven, which is the realm of all possibilities. Two, blessed are those who mourn. When we hit rock bottom, sometimes we can see more clearly than we have seen in quite a while. And when one door closes, another opens. 
I believe this. I experience this as being true personally. We gain confidence and resilience when we become aware of God's great love for us. And we let this love in. We let it heal us, comfort us, strengthen us. And we allow it to move us forward through whatever problem or difficulty we may be working with. And blessed are the meek. Becoming meek to God as Jesus was. This means acknowledging our human side, our human mistakes. And, and it also means that we acknowledge that there is a presence and power within us that is greater than that which appears in the world. So, blessed are we when we are poor in spirit, when we do mourn, and when we are meek. For ours is the kingdom of heaven, we shall be comforted, and we shall inherit the earth. God bless you.